talked about hormones. And uh, we talked about hormones being an issue. We talked about, um, what else was it? Behavior being an issue. And we talked about environment. Yeah, environment being an issue. Um, I'd like to look at what can we do to control one of those areas today. And as we look at issues that we may have in our life, whether it's at work, whether it's at uh, home, whether it's our health, if we can control what's the controllables. There's things that are non-controllables in our life, and we give those to God, right? But the things that we can control, we've got to take that and work with that. And so as I was coming up the other night, I asked Ivory if she could help me with this as we were coming from the airport. As we look at hormones, what are some of the challenges that we see with hormones? We're looking at natural remedy demo to balance hormones. But as we look at this, what are some of the challenges that we have with hormones? Well, some things that come to mind is I think they say weight gain can be associated with hormones or hair loss Mm -hmm. or acne or mood issues like anxiety, depression, or rage, right? Okay. Um, Anything else y'all can think of? Anything out here? What do hormones... Yes. Fatigue. Well, let's take a look at it. And I'd like to first start with some laws of health. And we talked about laws. You've talked about laws. Other folks have talked about laws. If I take this and let go of it, what happens? This is a law of gravity. Well, we have laws of health. And I find these eight basic laws, and for some of us, we've heard these our whole life. But let me tell you, as I sit down, as I work with folks at work, as a person comes in, I don't care if they have diabetes, if they have cancer, if they have whatever it may be. And I sit down and I say, okay, I go through these laws of health. What's your nutrition? What are you eating? How much water are you drinking? Tell me about your exercise because these laws are very important. How many of y'all grew up on a farm? Anybody? Okay. Drive a tractor? Anybody drive a tractor? Okay. You drive, oh, right. Anybody, anyone else drive a tractor? Okay. The quickest way I could get a whooping when I was a boy was take that tractor out and not grease it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You've got to grease that tractor. You've got to grease the implements. If you don't take care of that tractor, that tractor is what's providing for the family. You know, or we're going to have to get behind a horse and do it, you know. And so that tractor is very, very, very important. And so maintaining that tractor is important. Uh, Guys, did your dad teach you how to change oil? Did he? Y'all know what oil is, right? Oil. Did he teach you how to rotate the tires? Y'all say tires, don't you? Tires? Boy, y'all talk different up here. There's things that our fathers taught us. Ladies, what'd your mama teach you? Things to do. Oh, to fold laundry. And uh, she actually taught me to mow the lawn. (laughs) Okay. Ladies, is there things about the house that you got to do? Like, did you sweep the floor? Yeah, Yeah, cooking and certain ways to cook and. Iron and y'all say iron, don't you? Iron. Yes. Iron. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. So these laws of health, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance. Now temperance is making the right decisions. Now I used to think making the right decisions was only don't drink, don't do drugs, don't smoke, and that was it. But it's more than just that. Could it be making the right decisions in what you listen to on TV or watch on TV? Yeah, that makes sense. What about, could that affect your health? Yeah, it affects your mood and your mood can affect your hormones, right? Absolutely, yeah. What about what we listen to on the radio? Could that affect our mind? Definitely. Okay. What about social media? Could that affect our mind? Definitely. Yeah. What is the most important organ in the body? Why is the brain the most important organ in the body? It's how we communicate with God. And so we got to take care of it. And so as we look at temperance, yes, it's are we eating too much food? Or are we eating the right food? And It's just making the right decisions. But the most important thing is taking care of that brain. That is huge. 
fresh air, rest. And the foundation here of these laws of health is trusting God. And so, yes, we can talk about herbs and things to help with, you know, the estrogen, the progesterone, the testosterone. But these guys here are the foundation you got to take care of first. Very, very, very important. So let's jump into this. That being said, let's look at estrogen and um, progesterone issues. Common causes of problems with estrogen and progesterone being out of hormone, out of, out of, out of uh, uh, thank you, balance. Yes. <laughs> so number one, and I'm looking from, uh, and this is from Cleveland Clinic. Number one, that can throw your estrogen and progesterone off, according to Cleveland Clinic, could be medications. It could be hormone therapy. It could be oral contraceptives. That can definitely throw off your hormones. Body fat. What about stress? Yeah. Would you say? Definitely. Yeah, stress is huge. Um, I think it affects y'all's hormones more than it does ours. It I think it's equal. You think it's equal? Yeah. Okay. Um, I know it does affect ours. Okay. I'll go with that. So. How about alcohol? Mm. Alcohol? Absolutely. That affects hormones. Yes, sure does. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, liver issues? One of the things folks don't take care of is their liver. Uh, how many of y'all, when you change your, your oil in your car, I just changed the oil in my, I got a pickup truck an old Chevy pickup, and I changed the oil in it the other day. I changed the oil filter. Do y'all change your oil filter? What if you didn't change your oil filter? I didn't even know. I just take it in for oil service, and they do, you know, this mystery. Yes. How many of y'all get your oil filters changed? Well, your oil filter in the body is your liver. And when you eat chicken livers, you're eating that chicken's oil filter. Ooh. Or the cow liver, you're eating the cow's oil filter. It's just something to think about. But anyway, liver problems can affect hormones, but what could cause liver problems? Alcohol. Alcohol, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, when I teach kids, I go in the school system and I teach kids, and I talk about, you know, you don't want your livers turning green. Um, it could be... How about medications? Can medications affect your... Yeah, so medications can affect the hormones through, let's say, your hormone therapy or oral contraceptives, but any other type of medication can affect your hormones, your, your liver, and then affect your liver being affected can affect then your hormones. Synthetic xenoestrogens. Who's ever heard of that? Is it an issue? It is. And not for y'all, but just for us, all of us. It really is. It can be plastics, pesticides, household cleaning products, soaps, shampoos. It's an issue out there. It, pardon? Fluoride? Yeah, fluor I mean, fluoride affects so many different things in our body. It really does. I mean, um, iodine is really important for us. And did you know that fluoride inhibits your body, your thyroid's ability to properly absorb the iodine. So does chlorine and so does bromide. But yeah, I'd, for us, huge. Yeah. And so, ladies, as you look at plastics, pesticides, household cleaning products, soap, shampoos, that's why it's so important to look at labels and make sure it's good and clean products. That can affect your hormones. So how can we stabilize the, the, the hormones? And probably the big guy is food. Now, tell me, what's a good healthy diet? Well, I think organic veggies and grass-fed meat is okay. the healthiest diet. That's what I do. Okay. When I took nutrition, who's heard of Dr. T. Colin Campbell? I took nutrition from him at Cornell University. And Campbell taught us that, now I, I came up with dairy farm, as we mentioned the other night. Dairy farm, cattle, we also have beef cattle. We found at Cornell that actually the hormones that are in animals, now grass-fed's one, but still, the animals and dairy can affect our hormones. And we actually are better to go with that whole food, plant-based diet, but also with variety. And that's a 20-some year study by Cornell University uh, and Cambridge University. It's called the China Study. Anybody heard of the China Study? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. 
Uh, also, by doing intermittent fasting, they find, uh, can help with stabilizing of women's hormones. And one of the problems that we see today with intermittent fasting is when do people normally do intermittent fasting? I think, I mean, at, at night into the morning, a lot of them wait till like noon to eat, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so they don't eat till, till, now, we call it dinner is the noon meal. Oh, really? Yeah. That's you, lunch. <laughs> yeah, do you know why people call it lunch? Well, what happens if you read the old medical books? The old medical books in the 1800s, the doctor said it is unhealthy to eat lunch. Really? Yeah. Did y'all know that? It's unhealthy. Yeah, it's unhealthy to eat lunch, according to the old medical books. Well, the question then is, what is lunch? Well, lunch back then, well, you got to go back before the Industrial Revolution. See, man's home with his wife on the farm, and wife makes big dinner, big breakfast. And then wife makes big dinner, that noon meal, kind of like Christmas dinner, not Christmas lunch. Mm. And Thanksgiving dinner, not Thanksgiving lunch. And so they ate a big dinner, and then they ate a little supper. Like for me on the farm, we'd eat, in the summertime, we might eat watermelon and cantaloupe, or in the wintertime, we might have popcorn or, or tomato soup. That's it. We, didn't, we ate little for supper, big for dinner, big, big for breakfast, big for dinner, little. Remember the old... Eat breakfast like a king, dinner like a queen, supper like a college student or a pauper. Oh, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. So you want to eat that big breakfast. And see, when you skip breakfast, if you don't eat breakfast within two hours of awakening, you increase your risk of a heart attack and a stroke by 150% based on the platelets. And so when you eat breakfast, it thins those platelets out and you're less prone to that heart attack and a stroke. Also... Uh, Dr. Coop, he was this super smart guy on, on, uh, on the, uh, our uh, metabolism kind of world renowned. He found when you eat breakfast, it increases metabolism, you burn calories. When you eat dinner, it increases metabolism, it burns calories. But when you eat after three, the metabolism turns off, and then you don't lose weight as well. Well, so where's this breakfast dinner thing came in? So when the man went to the... Um, industries with the industrial revolution wife was there to make big breakfast was she there for dinner no, he was working yeah he went to work so she couldn't go and make dinner for him so she made this little meal for him and what happened was back then you know what a midnight snack is or a snack they called it lunch mm. they, that was the definition for snack was lunch so wife made lunch for husband to take little meal to take to the factory. And then when he came home at night, she made big meal. So big meal meant dinner. So they pulled the name from the noontime to supper. That's why we have dinner now at supper. And that's why as farmers, where grandma was still at the house, or mom's still at the house, they kept the noon meal calling it dinner. Mm, Isn't that interesting? Wow. So when you, when you look at intermittent fasting, Intermittent fasting, when you skip breakfast, it affects the platelets, you're more prone to the heart attack, you're more prone to the stroke. When you um, eat supper, you're more prone to gain weight because you're not burning those calories off. And people today, they're eating supper at 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And so when you eat a meal and lay down, that's how you make sumo wrestlers, is, is that you... It's serious. That's how you feed them, you lay them down. You feed them, you lay them down. You feed them, you lay them down. And that makes big sumo wrestlers. Well, when you eat uh, that evening meal, and if you eat it within three to four hours of laying down, that food has a propensity to putrefy and ferment. Well, do you think that's going to mess with your sleep? Yeah. yeah. It's going to mess with a lot of stuff. And so they found if we just adjust that clock and go back to big breakfast, big dinner, and then, if you do eat supper, eat it light, or just plum skip it. So, um, so then the next item is rest. Rest is really important. Is rest important for female hormones? Yeah. That is one of the biggest things that I find. Y'all need your rest. We need our rest, but y'all really need your rest. Um, nutrition, nutrition is very important, but rest is huge in female hormones. When y'all are stressed, you don't get your rest. And the next one's managing stress. It blows your adrenals. When you blow your adrenals, it affects hormones. Huge. Uh, next is exercise. Why do we need to exercise? Circulation. Perfect health. 
is perfect circulation. That's right. It increases the lymphatic system and, and movement. And so exercise is really important to help with hormones. Ideal body weight is another big one. Now, with the ladies, we'll talk about BMI, body mass index. With the guys, we're going to talk about something else possibly that might be a little different. Adrenal health, we talked about that. Um, addressing the adrenals. One of the best things I found for adrenals is um, nettle. Have you ever eat, eaten nettle tea? Drank nettle tea, I mean? Well, I just started last week not even knowing you were going to talk about this. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I have a friend who, her, she grew her hair super long in like six months with nettle. She brews nettle every day. Yeah, I was up in Alaska a couple months ago, maybe a month or two ago, and we went for breakfast. There's a little doctor come in. She must have been this tall. I mean, she looked like a 12-year-old. And she comes in for breakfast, and she, she's bringing in this pile of leaves. And I said, what's that? She says, breakfast. I said, what is it? It was nettle. And she got out a skillet, she put water in it, and she started sautéing them nettle leaves. Did she have long hair? <laughs> I don't remember. Did you know, though, for hair, it is very good for hair, but for men, I haven't seen it happen with, men, with women, but I have found it true with men about, now Mary Lou tells me I need to do this because I, I got a white mustache here, but um, it actually, guys will tell me, Within normally six months, their hair starts turning back to the regular color. Now, Michael, I don't know what's going on. Your beard would work, though. <laughs> Michael and I are the same age. Michael and I are good friends. We've known each other for 23 years. Um, nettle is huge. So I'm, I've got a big old herb cabinet at the office. It's probably, oh, it's wider than this piece right here. And it's a, a, I'd say it goes way on down through here. And I'm there at the herb cabinet one day. And this lady comes in, and they own this big old dude ranch. And, I mean, her husband comes in. He's got spurs and whatever else they wear. And she looks like a cowgirl coming in, and she's got a hat. And she comes in one day, and she says, you got any nettle? And I said, I think I'm plumb out, but let me check. And so I squat down. I, I knew I was out in the jars, but I looked down underneath, and I was plumb. Y'all know what plumb means, right? It means Totally. So if you want to tell Heidi that it's good food, tell her it's plum good. That's the best. That's like Michael. That is the best. Yeah, if you want to tell a lady from the south it's good food, tell her her food's plum good. But do not say it's plum awful, or she'll throw an orange skillet at you. So you better be careful. Um, but she comes in and she says, "Walt, I, you have the nettle." And I finally looked and I said, "No, we're, we're plum out." And she says, "You better get it in quick, or this county's going to be on national news again." <laughs> And I said, why? She said, as many women as you and Mary Lou got on that stuff for our hormones, we will make national news. Wow. It's huge. It helps the adrenals very, very well. And adrenals are very, you know, ashwagandha. There's a lot of things you can do for your, your, your adrenals. Stress is what really blows them bad, but nettles is an excellent source. It has, it's packed with calcium. It's probably the most nutritious of all herbs in North America. Yeah. It's amazing. And your home state, Wisconsin, when I go there, as we mentioned the other night, I think, I think I mentioned it to you, the ladies up there in Minnesota, Wisconsin, they will take nettles and they will make soup out of it. They'll, make, they'll put it in their stews. Very nutritious. The next one is wild yam cream. And so wild yam cream is an excellent uh, product that helps with ladies' hormones. Who's ever... Heard of wild yam cream. Wild yam cream is very good. Now, prior to this, we'd use uh, HRTs, uh, like Premarin. Do you know what Premarin stands for? Pregnant mare urine. Oh, it's close. Yeah, pregnant mare urine. Now, do you oh. want to take pregnant mare urine? Absolutely not. A horse urine? Yes. No. And so you're getting the, you're getting the, uh, the, the estrogen from that urine from that pregnant horse. Yeah, and so there's this lady, um, she came, and so she had us, uh, taught us to use um, twice-cooked soy milk, and you make soy milk. Who's ever made soy milk? Okay, so you make the soy milk, and then you cook it again, but be careful, it's scalded the second time real bad, and so cook it just a little bit for 10 to 20 minutes. There's as much estrogen 
in one cup of twice cooked soy milk as there is in one primer. But you're still only stabilizing the estrogen and that's not where you want to go and that was the problem. So there's this guy out in California, Dr. Lee, and he found we ought to stabilize the, uh, the progesterone. Well, one of his associates, Cynthia Johnston, found that, well, what if we stabilize the progesterone? And if you stabilize the progesterone, it will stabilize the estrogen and stabilize the testosterone. She did that with wild yam cream. So that's, that's just sweet taters. And it's transdermal. Uh, over the years, there's been different ways of doing it, you know, different places, but we find that probably really doesn't matter that much anymore where you stick it. But a lot of ladies will put it over the ovaries or inner thighs or inner arm or over the chest and some put it on their face. And they usually put it like a, a, half a, a quarter of a teaspoon to half a teaspoon twice a day. Transdermally goes in. Wild yam, and it also usually has Vitex with it. Vitex is another herb that's really good. But um, the wild yam will stabilize the progesterone. When you stabilize the progesterone, then you stabilize the estrogen. And we get much better estrogen stabilization using the wild yam. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. I've seen yam in, in powdered capsules. Does that work? Not as well. I find it Now, I have found that I do have ladies tell me that they can drink a tea out of it or use the capsules, but most ladies tell me that the transdermal works better for them. Yeah. Um, the next one is Vitex or Chaseberry. You can add the, um, the Vitex extra if the wild yam's not doing enough. And, um, and so the Vitex, it's also called Chaseberry, and you can do that as an extract, like two mLs, uh, one to three times a day. Raspberry leaf, you've done that, yes? I like to drink raspberry leaf tea. Yeah. Yes. All right. right so here. we'll swap here and red. Who's done red raspberry? Red raspberry. Great tea for uh, for ladies. I knew there was something else. Can we jump back just real quick? Yeah. So if you use wild yam, if you still mince when you're when you start that day one, stop for seven days, and then start back. If the lady has multiple cycles a month, pl just plow through the second cycle. But the first cycle, stop on day one for seven days, then start back. If the lady's no longer mincing, just do it all the time. Okay, so red raspberry. Um, have you ever taken red, red raspberry? Is yeah, I, I drink the tea all the time. Okay, what do you drink for? Uh, for my hormones. I know it's good okay. for female hormones. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know that so many women have hormone issues. I just want to yeah. make sure I don't. Yeah, it just helps to stabilize the hormones. It really does. Um, I had a lady that, um, it's been several months ago. This has probably been around May. She called me and she said, Walt, I need help. She said, I have to sit on a towel. And uh, she said, my, my hemoglobin is very low and I'm having extreme bleeding. She says, I started with some, uh, I said, she said, I've started with some, uh, some uh, red raspberry. It has reduced it a little bit, but it's still excessive. I still have to sit on a towel. And I said, well, let's add something to it. Um, and that's this guy right here, Shepherd's Purse. Who's ever used Shepherd's Purse? Shepherd's Purse. I said, let's do Shepherd's Purse. It took her the longest. Normally, just one day, it's, it takes care of the problem. So... If you have, I've, I've had numerous ladies through the years that have, have called me and they've been uh, bleeding for over a month and, um, and sometimes several months. And normally just one day of shepherd's purse will stop that bleeding. This lady, it took three days, but it stopped it. Isn't that amazing? And God good? Yeah. Now, you know, can you imagine if, if you had an issue and you went to your uh, GYN and you said... Um, you know, I'm having this major issue, and they offer you a prescription, and they say, uh, and you say, well, will you take it first? No. But this is not going to hurt you. you know? It's incredible that doctors probably don't know anything about this. Yeah, yeah. it's so healing. And I, I was just reading that hospitals have uh, contracts with the same food companies that serve prisons. Uh, so... When you're in the hospital, you're eating prison food. 
Okay, so maca. Who's ever heard of maca? Yes. Uh, maca is 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 very well, very good for uh, female hormones, and we'll get to that. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but maca is great for stabilizing hormones, but it also gives energy. It's great for giving energy. Um, black cohosh. Who's heard of black cohosh? That is the only one that you'll usually see the GYNs using is the, uh, the black cohort. Now they will use the wild yam uh, for dryness as a cream. Uh, you will find that, uh, but um, there's another product called Vital V that works well for that, but you usually only see the GYNs using the black cohosh. I don't like the black cohosh as much as these other guys, but uh, it is a tool that can be used. Uh, Dung Kwai, you sort of Dung Kwai. That's another tool that can be used. Um, fenugreek. Who's heard of fenugreek? What do you think of using fenugreek for? What? Blood sugar? Yes, it will help with blood sugar. Okay, hair? What else? Yes, increasing milk flow. So we have ladies come in and they're not able to breastfeed. And we had this doctor. He he came in and he says, "My wife, she's just not, it's just not working." And uh, and I, 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 he says, "I know the need for breast milk." He says, "But I'm just, she can't produce it. anything we can do." Well, let me turn and tell you, she turned into a Holstein. Y'all know what a Holstein is? A milk uh, cow. Yeah, you can tell I grew up on a dairy farm, right? <laughs> I mean, she wasn't just a Jersey; she was a Holstein. <laughs> She had to cut back. She was producing so much milk. Wow. And we were using fenugreek. That was the big part of it. And this is the cool thing. Ladies will come in who adopt, and I have them talk with Mary Lou, and they're able to breastfeed. Is that not cool? Wow. That is so cool. I mean, just the bonding, the nutrition, it's, it's huge. Fenugreek, it's amazing. So, yes, not only is it good just for stabilizing hormones, but it also helps with, as you're saying, their uh, increasing breast milk. And, you know, I have ladies that come in and they say, you know, they just don't think there's hope. You know, they want to breastfeed the child. And I talk a lot about breastfeeding because in my home state of Tennessee, in 1969, Michael, when we were nine years old, um, <laughs> the, we were the fourth healthiest state in the United States. In 2009, we were the fourth unhealthiest state in the United States. And the number one cause for that change was because food. Um, our food changed. In 1969, when we went out to eat, it was going to grandma's house to eat. Now, that was going out to eat. In 2009, there's people, they just don't, you know, they don't even meet. I have people don't even meet at home that come see me. They don't even cook at home. They go to restaurants. You know, they, they, they don't go, you know, they don't cook at home. And that was a huge disparity between what we ate in 69 and 2009. The other one was what we drank. In 1969, you might get a little Coca-Cola. Y'all know Coca-Cola's all right. Coca-Cola's, we call them Coca-Cola's. A little Coca-Cola, about eight ounces, and every once in a while. And that was a treat, or a dope. Who knows what a dope is? Moon pie and a dope? A dope is a soft drink. And you, and very little. But in 2009, we, I mean, you get a, you get you go out to eat and you you've got a um, you get a gulp or you know or you, they fill up your your drink at the at the uh, restaurant and then they keep filling it back up and filling it back up and people drink a lot of soft drinks and so it was a huge change in what people drank between 2000 I'm sorry 1969 and in 2009 the next thing was exercise in 1969 uh, I, I walked. Well, I rode my bicycle to school unless I was in trouble. Then Dad made me walk. He took the bicycle from me. But um, we we exercised, right? In 2009, did folks exercise? No, they're playing their games or whatever. But the fourth thing was breastfeeding. And in 1969, we had a lot more breastfeeding. I ask girls today, you know, they'll come in with croup, their baby, or colic, and I'll say, do you breastfeed? No. I say, why? That's gross. Or my girlfriends don't breastfeed, so I don't, I don't breastfeed. Breastfeeding is huge, so important for that baby's health. And so I try to train a lot on, 
on, on breastfeeding and the importance of breastfeeding. Finger your Greek is very good for that. Dandelion root is another one that's good for hormones. I like dandelion root. It's an excellent uh, herb. It's very nutritious. Uh, it, uh, it's good for kidney function. It's good for uh, the, if I'm having kidney issues, I'm doing corn silk and dandelion. If I'm having liver issues, I'm doing, I'm doing uh, milk thistle and dandelion root. Uh, dandelion leaf is better for like edema, like congestive heart failure, or if you're having issues with edema. You're gonna, it works as an excellent lack. Uh, the next one is cramp bark. The next one is ginger. Yeah, ginger's really helpful for, uh, for hormones. Red clover, now that's a debatable issue. You know, folks say, no, that's a phytoestrogen. You don't want phytoestrogens. And let me tell you what, we could argue to the cows come home on that one because you have PhDs on both sides of the fence. One saying that phytoestrogens are dangerous, other folks saying phytoestrogens are really healthy. Who remembers Dr. Agatha Thrash? And I asked Dr. Thrash about this one. I said, Dr. Thrash, what is your research on phytoestrogens? And she said, well, they are very healthy for us. Uh, so we have uh, red clover, ashwagandha. Uh, who's ever done ashwagandha? Ashwagandha is amazing. Um, my challenge, I, I, I do ashwagandha almost every day, if Mary Lou has anything to do with it. Um, my problem is, is I used to work in regular health care where I had to do a whole lot of, and I'd have 200 and some employees or whatever. And, and so my brain's always thinking I got to get all this done. And, and now I, I don't have that many employees. There's just a couple of us there at work. And, and my brain still thinks of all the stuff I want to do. And I don't have the, the volume, the, you know, the horsepower to do it. So I lay down and sleep at night and I can't go to sleep because I'm thinking everything I didn't get done and everything I want to get done. And, and I just can't go to sleep. And so she tells I'm not asleep. So she'll give me an ashwagandha or two, and that just calms my brain down, and I go to sleep. But it's also good for ladies for your hormones. It really is. Let's go back. Um, another one I like for ladies' hormones is this guy right here. Flax seeds. Anybody ever do flax seeds? Flax seeds are amazing. They're great for ladies' hormones. You could do, it depends on how much stress you have. Um, I, you know, y'all think different than we do. We are different, you know, um, ladies and men. Uh, you know, I was telling ladies, just do three tablespoons twice a day if you've got a lot of stress. Uh, no, I was telling two tablespoons three times a day. And Mary Lou goes, you got to look at what's, re you know, reasonable and obtainable. We're busy. What if we just do three tablespoons twice a day? Well, that'll work, but I just like you know, dividing it out a little more. But you want to get it done, right? And so th two tablespoons, if you're just not having a lot of stress, but if you have a lot of stress, do three tablespoons twice a day. Flax seeds, uh, you've got some great omega-3s, your omega-6s, good ratio. It's got tryptophan. And what's tryptophan going to turn into? It's going to turn into serotonin. And then it's going to turn into melatonin. And what converts it? As the sun comes through the eye without sunglasses, or if your glasses tint, this ain't going to work. But um, also you got to grind it and eat it within 15 minutes. you got to grind it and eat it within 15 minutes because flaxseed oxidizes very rapidly. It's very fragile. Yeah, and that's why God put such a hard seed around it. And, and or so, you could just chew on it, right? It might be tough on your teeth, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> you could, but you got to break it open. And you could chew it if, if you soften it or something. And um, so the tryptophan in the flaxseed, as you go outside and you get sunshine through the eye, it's going to stimulate the pineal gland, which actually is the first thing that formed when we were being formed. The, the pineal gland then converts the tryptophan into serotonin. And then if you don't eat a big supper, if you go to bed on time, then the pineal gland turns the serotonin into melatonin. Nice. And it's also packed full of uh, also uh, phytoestrogen, which also helps with hormones. Now, I have seen refrigerated flaxseed oil at the store. Is that good, or is it already oxidized? You know, if you ask the people who make it, they tell you that it's, it's probably okay. Uh, but um, I think you're going to get the best if you just grind it yourself. Also, you, you can buy it in the store on the shelf, uh, already ground. That's great for fiber. 
but it's not going to give you that tryptophan. Uh, it's not going to give the, 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 the some of those nutrients that oxidized off. So you want to buy it. Like, plus, it's cheaper like this. And then you can just uh, grind it with your coffee grinder and use it that meal. So that's ladies' hormones, men's hormones. Common causes of issues with males with uh, testosterone issues, insufficient nutrition. I think that was the first one on the ladies, wasn't it? Um, testosterone killing foods, sugar, refined grains, white bread, white flour, pasta, white pasta, white rice. Uh, chronic stress. Again, you, know, you said we, it messes with us. Stress does. Stress is the number one, di uh, number one uh, diagnosis in America. Uh, they tell us depression will soon surpass that, according to the World Health Organization. Sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation lowers testosterone. And that's been, been proven. And we see so much issues with sleep deprivation. And as I look at sleep, I look at three things. I look at uh, how many hours of sleep they're getting. Um, when you look at the Brizol Bellock study out of California, it's, uh, it's 6,900 people in that study for a 16-year period. They found the best time or the best effect for people to live longer is if they get eight hours sleep at night. Harvard is saying seven and a half, but they're really flirting with eight as I read. They're, I mean, they say seven and a half, but I'm, I see them talk a lot about eight hours sleep. Uh, Mayo, the last I read from Mayo was seven hours sleep, but um, that people just aren't getting enough sleep. You know, they're getting probably average. A lot of folks out there, when they come talk to me, I ask them, you know, what time do you go to bed at night? And it's usually midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock. That's when they're going to bed, some three o'clock. The second item you want to look at is what time are they going to bed? When I was in school, they taught us that the brain did not have a lymphatic system. Just they talk, you dog. Uh, around 2013, um, they actually found that the brain does have a lymphatic system, so the glymphatic system, and it turns on somewhere around nine o'clock at night, and uh, does a deep clean uh, from nine to ten. Then it does a thorough clean and flushing the brain between ten at midnight. If you ain't sleeping, you ain't flushing the toilet. You're just not cleaning the brain up. And so those hours before midnight also were told, or were twice the hours after midnight. So who knew Dr. Uh, Walter Strachan? Anybody know Dr. Walter Strachan? Dr. Strachan was a psychiatrist. Uh, his last 14 years of practicing medicine, he was at Loma Linda. He, did, he used no pharmaceuticals. He went to bed at 4.30, the latest 5 o'clock every night. He wanted those hours before midnight uh, to get that benefit. The, um, the third thing I look at as sleep deprivation, are you getting that contiguous sleep? Are you getting that REM sleep? Um, are you waking up, men, you know, however many times a night to go to the bathroom? Ladies, are you waking up because you ate too late and, and it's waking you up? Or, or now you're waking up and you're worrying about the kids, you're worrying about the job, you're working about, worrying about whatever, and you're not falling back asleep. And I'm getting so many people that are waking up that 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they can't fall back asleep. And that is sleep deprivation. Another one that lowers testosterone is alcohol. Alcohol is big in lowering uh, testosterone. The other one is visceral fat, belly fat. Visceral fat increases estradiol. Elevated estradiol lowers testosterone. And we're seeing a lot of visceral fat issues out there today. Imbalanced microflora, and we could talk all weekend on that issue, um, you know, having that good microflora, not only in the colon, but also in the mouth. Low vitamin D levels. Um, how many of y'all here know your blood level vitamin D? It's not how much vitamin D you take a day. Like I have this lady come in and she's Caucasian, which means uh, I was in Africa. Uh, the last time I was in Africa, I, I took this uh, Dr. Irvin Davis from South Georgia. He's a black fella and um, he's a physician. And he told the African physicians and nutritionists that we were teaching, he said, he said, our skin has sunglasses on it. He says it takes six times more exposure to the sun than it does Walt to get vitamin D. That's quite a bit. And so this lady comes into me. She's, she's taking 5,000 IUs of vitamin D 
she's Caucasian. She works out in landscaping, 300, you know, all year, all, all 12 months. And her vitamin D level is 12. Now, blood level, lab, te lab tells you somewhere between, um, somewhere between um, 30 and 100. Uh, Dr. Arvo Kana, who's a neurologist that specializes in, in brain function, tells you he doesn't want his patients lower than 60 for brain function. Or Dr. Ted Watkins, who's looking at, at bone density or, you know, for osteoporosis or for, um, for immune system, he doesn't want it below 80. Here's a lady, she's at 12, and she's taking 5,000. So it's not how much you take, it's what your blood level is. That's what you want to check. Uh, what, yeah. Why wasn't she observing it? What did she uh, need to do? Good question. Because she was in the sun and yeah. she was taking the supplement. So we went to, went to uh, we doubled it, went to, uh, we went to 5,000 twice a day. For three months, it went to 17. And so I called my buddy. I called my buddy up in D.C. and he said, he said, let's go to 20,000 twice a day. That's 40,000. Went three months. It, it went to 24. And then, we, then I said, you know what? There was a study that came out just within a week of that time about the effects of magnesium and vitamin D. And I said, let's do magnesium to bowel tolerance. She went to 97. She was just low in vitamin and magnesium. Yeah. Um, weight gain, inadequate exercise, prescription drugs, except, especially statin drugs. Statin drugs will lower testosterone. And then those uh, syn synthetic uh, xenoestrogens, those, uh, those plastics out there. So what can we do? Whole food plant-based diet, stress reduction, heavy weight training, interval training, a liver detox, zinc. Men are more prone to lose zinc than ladies. That's just the way we're made, y'all. And so making sure the man has adequate zinc, uh, vitamin D, uh, quality sleep, very important. Uh, lower that body fat percentage. And for if a man is very muscular, look at his percent body fat. Because sometimes I, I had a guy that was plumb off the chart. Plumb off the chart on, um, on uh, BMI, body mass index. But if I went to pinch him, he had no fat. I mean, this guy was built like a bull. He, was a, he, was a, he would win the Guinness Book of World Records at least once, if not twice a year. Very strong man. It was just muscle. So folks built more like that, uh, percent body fat, I think is a little more accurate than BMI. Sarsaparilla. Now, this is the guy that's amazing. So I have guys come in and they say, Walt, I want to increase my testosterone. My T's low. Doc said I had to do something, but I want to do something healthy. I don't want to put a cream in and rub it up against my wife tonight or my daughter. Uh, do you have anything? So we'll do sarsaparilla. We'll do two dropper fulls uh, three times a day for the first week. And then after that, we'll do two dropper fulls a day. And uh, they report they're doing well. My buddy up in D.C., uh, he checks his labs on his, on his, uh, his male patients, and he does see that T climbing. And so we do see, you know, quantitatively able to, to measure that, that, um, that testosterone level. Then the guys, they're doing well, their T's up high, they don't come in and get it anymore. Then guess who comes in and gets it? Their wife. Yeah, she'll come in, she'll say, well, what were you giving Henry? He ain't working like he was, he was around the house. I need some more energy, and that stuff worked. And she'll buy it. Take it home and get it down him somewhere or another, so he have more energy. Oh, I thought you were me. She started taking. Oh it. no, she was giving it back to him because he got lazy again. And you know, so, I've heard of women taking testosterone. Uh, this one fitness girl said on her Instagram that she started taking testosterone from the doctor because the doctor said her testosterone was low. What do you? What's your take well, on that? Well, that's you said a very important thing. He said it was low. So if it was low, she needs to do something to bring it up to normal. But I'd rather use the Wild GM cream to stabilize progesterone, which then will stabilize testosterone. And it just naturally does it under the female process of progesterone being at the right level. Um, it is true if it's low, we need to bring it back up. Very much so. Um, maca, again, uh, maca is used, ginseng. Uh, be careful, ladies, on ginseng. Um, ginseng. Um, you can, certain types of ginseng can cause your voice to lower, can give you hair, facial hair. So be careful with, with ginseng so you see how it helps us. Uh, ginger, uh, ashwagandha, salt palmetto, pine bark, 
and tribulus. And we have just a few moments left. And let me cover an item that's not covered very much. But it's a huge issue. I believe there's a war going on. Do y'all agree there's a war going on? Tuesday morning I get this tones drop around oh, just a few minutes after 7. Uh, 35-year-old male on the floor, unresponsive, not breathing. Not a good thing. I get there and uh, didn't have a good outcome. Mom's out on the porch crying. And I went out and I talked to her and, she, you know, and put my arm around her and I'm talking to her. And she says, why? I said, is there somebody I can call? Can I call your preacher? She says, we ain't got no preacher. I said, do you go to church? We don't, go, we don't do church. She says, well, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. I said, well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. She says, but why? Why did this happen? I said, ma'am, there's a war going on between God and Satan. And her son was doing stuff that caused that to happen. And um, as many times I go out, and it's sad. It's so, you know what's the saddest? It's for the wife to be so angry at the husband or the separated female and saying, how am I going to tell the kids? That's what was sad Tuesday morning, was hearing the mother over the phone as, the, as this guy's mother calls his ex to say, you know, Henry's dead. Um, and she's, I mean, she, she wasn't working. I mean, she didn't, didn't touch her at all. She must not like him too much. And, um, but um, she started crying, how am I going to tell the child? That's, that's sad. But I said, there's a war going on. There's a war going on between God and Satan. Now, if Satan can take out anybody, if he could choose anybody, he wants to take out the family. Would you agree? That family unit. And, and we see that in the culture today. Wanting, Do we not see that? They want to take out that, that husband-wife situation. And God gave a husband and a wife something very important. It sometimes doesn't work right when hormones go nuts. And I believe that component that God gave the husband and wife, they need to have that relationship. I had one lady tell me one time, she says, I told my husband, I didn't care who's he with, just as long as he's left me alone. That's not very healthy, y'all. And so libido is an issue. We're talking hormones. We're talking family. God gave that relationship between husband and wife and libido needs to be there. Would you agree? And we see the loss of libido. What causes that? It can be. Um, uh, well, I, I, I find it's the hormones are messed up. Whether it's on the guy's side or on the lady's side. And how do we do, deal with that? Go back to the hormones. That good nutrition. Let's get, let's get the progesterone working. Let's get the the estrogen working. Let's get that testosterone on the lady that's up. As you were talking, she may have low. Let's get it where it belongs. The guys, let's get that testosterone where it belongs so that that family can be strong and have a relation and not have a wedge jammed in between it because one of them doesn't want the other one. And I have that so often. People come in and they say, my spouse has, my spouse has no desire for me. That's huge. Or they'll come in and say, I have no desire for my spouse. And it's tearing my spouse up. We need to take care of that. And so, yes, um, what the things we're talking about here, mock is a great way to do it. There's different things, but it's important to your spouse if it's not important to you. So take a look at that because Satan will do anything to destroy the family. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.